Uh, I'm so pleased to see that we have a uh, full, full house here, hardly a seat uh, available. Um, I think that's this demonstration of interest is a reflection on the quality of, the, of this panel. Um, but let me, before I introduce the panelists briefly, let me just say uh, uh, why I think that it is it was a very, very good, in fact, a necessary addition to the program of uh, Davos this year to include this segment on the, on the health and on the future, on the state of the transatlantic relationship and, and, and of course, particularly um, on uh, the political military aspects of this relationship. Um, we have a number of big challenges. Uh, one of them has the name of, uh, of the current American president. Uh, <laughs> another, uh, another challenge, just to throw out a couple of uh, points, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this more, uh, is the future of the arms control process. Um, and by the way, arms control, the way I, uh, learned this, is not only nuclear arms control and ballistic nuclear weapons, it's also about conventional arms. And increasingly, we will need to talk in the future also about uh, the question, is there such a thing as arms control in cyber, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, so I think this is an, an essentially important uh, discussion that we're having. And I'm very, very pleased to have this fantastic panel. I will. Just very briefly, since these panelists are all uh, known by their first names and last names and by their professional background, to I'm sure all of you, but very briefly, Secretary uh, uh, General of NATO, uh, Stoltenberg, Jens Stoltenberg, who of course comes from Norway, was Prime Minister uh, Norway, has been running NATO brilliantly for the last several years namely since 2014. Um, and uh, he is in charge of, of course, this year, uh, celebrating the 70th anniversary of NATO. It was founded 70 years ago. My own country only joined NATO for reasons well known um, only in the 1950s, but it was at the end of the 40s that this organization was originally uh, hatched, so to speak. To his left, uh, to his left, is Ursula von der Leyen, who also certainly do doesn't need an introduction. Has also been a defense minister in Germany for the last four years. Um, uh, well known to everybody, has served in in other cabinet functions in the Merkel government ever since the Merkel government was first elected, and that's, ladies and gentlemen, a pretty long time actually. Uh, then we have uh, to uh, Ursula von der Leyen's left, uh, John Kerry. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank the um, Secretary of State, the former Secretary of State, for taking a very quick decision yesterday when, of course, when it became known that Secretary Pompeo would not be able to be here. Um, Philip, where are you and I? approached uh, John Kerry and said, uh, well, you may not be the current Secretary of State, but you are his direct and immediate predecessor. Would you be kind enough to, uh, to take his, his place? And you were, you were kind enough, changed your schedule around, and thank you for being with us, John. I'm looking for a headline, Kerry replaces Pompeo. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wouldn't that be something? Under this president, yes. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, folks. The other day, the other day, I uh, just kidding. <laughs> then to his uh, uh, to his left is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland, Jacek uh, Czaputowicz, who is a more recent 
uh, a member of the list of NATO foreign ministers. He has only served in this position for roughly a year. So was deputy foreign minister before that, and of course comes from, a, from an academic background, professor of political science. So welcome, uh, uh, Jacek. And then last, but certainly not least, my old, my old friend uh, Kishore Mabubanu, Mabubani, who um, uh, has been uh, a, a very impressive uh, academic representative of his country, Singapore, but uh, who is known in, in, in my world, in the, in the diplomatic world, as, a, as, as an eminent diplomat, one who has written many books, served with great <coughs> distinction as Singapore's perm rep uh, in, at the United Nations, and who has never had, as long as I've known you, uh, Kishori, you have never had difficulty in adding your comments to whatever anybody else had to say about anything. So uh, uh, it's really great. So, to so have thank you. you for allowing me to be provocative. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, <coughs> this is this is the lineup, and I'm really happy to have been asked to uh, lead uh, lead us through this. What we'll be doing now is I'll ask a couple of questions of uh, uh, of the panelists, and I hope that within like 20 minutes or so. Uh, we would then open it up to you, uh, to the audience, and if you wish to uh, speak, ask a question, or offer a brief comment, hopefully only a brief comment, uh, please, for the benefit also of the cameras, please do us a favor, get up, identify yourself, and if you have a question, it would be helpful if you said whether the question is addressed to the entire panel or to just one specific member of the panel. In that way, I think we will use this hour most effectively. Let me start with Secretary Stoltenberg. 70 years of NATO. Um, unfortunately, at the beginning of this year, some of the newspaper headlines, commentaries, are filled with the idea or the vision that we are entering a new age of great power competition. Uh, Russia, United States, China, etc. Where is NATO? What's the role of NATO uh, uh, in this, <coughs> in this uh, unfolding uh, situation? And uh, how confident are you that we are actually going to have something to celebrate in April? <laughs> um, we will celebrate in April. Um, um, but NATO's role is uh, today fundamentally uh, the same as it was back in 1949 and that is uh, that we protect and defend each other, that we uh, uh, really believe that we are safer together than apart. Uh, NATO is based on the uh, idea that uh, uh, it's one for all and all for one, and that has uh, kept us all safe and secure for uh, uh, 70 uh, years. The big difference is that we are doing that in a very different world, uh, because for 40 years, from 1949 to 1989, it was one uh, well-defined threat and challenge, and that was the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. Uh, now, uh, neither the Soviet Union nor the Warsaw Pact exist. Actually, eight of the Warsaw Pact members, or eight, they are, uh, they are now members of, uh, no, there were eight members, seven are members of NATO, and the eighth member, the eighth member doesn't exist anymore, that was the Soviet Union. So we have to do uh, 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 collective defense, um, uh, provide security in a very different world where we have many threats, many challenges at the same time. Cyber, terrorism, um, uh, we have proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction. We have tendencies to great power competition uh, between China, Russia, United States. And we have also a, a, a Russia which is much more assertive, respons responsible for aggressive actions from the Kirk Strait to the streets of Salisbury using their agent there. So we have to do fundamentally the same in a very different uh, security environment. Uh, the good news is that NATO is adapting. And that's actually the reason why we should celebrate, is that NATO has been able to change uh, while, the, uh, the, uh, while the world is changing. We have implemented the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War with high readiness of our forces. Mm -hmm. We have deployed forces in the east and part of the alliance for the first time uh, in our history, uh, battle groups there. 
um, uh, uh, and we are doing more together in North America and the United States. And contrary to what many people believe, the US is not leaving Europe. They reduced their presence after the end of the Cold War. Mm. Uh, and the last US battle tank left Europe in December 2013. But now the US is back with a full armored brigade. So actually the US is now increasing their presence in Europe as a response to the need to strengthen NATO and uh, collective defense <coughs> in, uh, in uh, Europe. European allies are also stepping up. Um, uh, since 2016, uh, they have increased defense spending across Europe and Canada uh, by 41 billion US dollars. We had a, a NATO summit in July uh, last, uh, no, this, uh, last year in July, and uh, there we agreed to uh, further strengthen our efforts, and we now see the results based on national plans coming in from all the allies. They will add 100 billion US dollars by the end of next year. So things are changing. Uh, 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 by 2024, we expect 350 billion US dollars. So it has been a lot of focus from uh, not least the US on burden sharing. And my message to the United States uh, is that actually uh, uh, we are improving burden sharing. We see the results. Uh, uh, European allies are stepping up. The last thing I'll mention, uh, which we are, uh, the most immediate challenge we are faced with, is the breakdown, uh, the potential breakdown of the INF Treaty. The INF Treaty is a cornerstone uh, for uh, arms control for uh, our security. It's a treaty we, uh, that was signed in 1987. It introduced the number of uh, missiles. It banned all missiles, zero. And it has served us all very, very well. The problem now is that uh, Russia is deploying uh, new missiles in Europe, violating the treaty. The United States stated at the NATO uh, foreign ministerial meeting in uh, December uh, last year that by the 2nd of uh, February, if Russia has not come back into compliance by then, then they would start the process of withdrawing from that treaty. We will meet Russia tomorrow in the NATO-Russia Council in Brussels uh, uh, with NATO allies. And our task, our main goal is to continue to try to call on Russia to come back in, into compliance because these missiles are mobile, they are nuclear capable, they are hard to detect, uh, they, they have short warning time, they can reach European cities, so they are by uh, uh, that also reducing the threshold for any potential use of nuclear weapons. So, there are many reasons for staying strong together in NATO also for the next uh, seven years. Thank you. Yeah, yes, thank you very much. I mean, that, that's a, that's um, an, explication, an explanation of uh, essentially an, uh, NATO as a healthy organization faced with serious challenges. But let me turn to uh, John Kerry. I mean, you know, in my country, in, in Germany, we had for the first time in decades newspaper paper articles, not many, but some, that started arguing, apparently we can no longer trust the United States. Maybe we should have, you know, a European or even a German bomb. Uh, can we still rely on the United States? What's uh, your take on the health of this alliance and how it should be taken forward. Well, Wolfgang, thank you. First of all, thank you for uh, asking me to join you here today. This is a really timely and important topic. I'm delighted to be with all of our panelists, but I particularly want to say how a pleasure it is to be back with Jens and with Ursula. Um, we worked so closely together for such a long period of time um, without rancor and without insults, gratuitous or otherwise. Um, and that's what I want to try to talk about today in, in the context of NATO and Europe. Uh, and I ask you, all of you, to think about this discussion in a larger context. Um, NATO was created and the European project was created to stop Europeans from killing each other, bluntly put. And if you go back to the 1940s and 50s and the challenge of a then Soviet Union, um, just because the uh, nature of the entities have changed, 
i.e. Soviet Union to a Russia to a Federation and so forth, Europe, etc. cetera. Um, just because that's changed does not change the fundamental interests and values that underscore not just NATO, but Europe. And, and NATO is integrally a component of the European project. It has to be viewed as such. And there are countless ways, I mean, Jens could run through a long list of ways in which NATO has proven itself as a bulwark in support of the European project. Now, writ large, globally, this is a moment in human history. It's a moment in the, in the, in the movement of, 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 of the challenges on this planet, and they are massive and grown right now. This is a moment for the world to be coming together, not to be breaking apart. And you have to measure the breaking apart, whether it's a Brexit, whether it's the turmoil in several European countries, uh, the, the sort of neo-populism slash, I would say, demagoguery that is uh, pulling people into a place of fear again in Europe. Uh, you have to stop and measure history, folks. Uh, no place has done well when economies are become tense, when people don't do well economically and shared prosperity of globalization, when you have uh, uh, demonstrable discrimination uh, and, and fear promoted through, uh, through exploitation of religion or, uh, or sect or tribe or geography uh, or uh, you know, background. The history is not good when those forces are unleashed. And then, when you add to it, a demagogue who comes along and wants to exploit it. And I think all of you can find one or two or three or four demagogues at work today. The fact is that uh, there are leaders of major countries in the world uh, who are promoting a new narrative about the liberal order of the West, which is part of what NATO is. It's part of this bulwark that was built in the aftermath of World War II and the history of the 20th century and the numbers of people who died in that century, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, and so forth. It, 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 it's you know, vastly more killing than is taking place anywhere on the earth today. And part of the reason for that is NATO. Part of the reason for that are the values that are lived out in Europe. Frankly, it astonishes me and troubles me that there are greater and more voices in Europe. There are voices, Angela Merkel, Macron people who've stood up for Europe. But there aren't enough voices celebrating the extraordinary meaning of the last 70 years. Europe has the highest standard of living in the world. Europe has the best healthcare system in the world. Europe has high wages. Europe has the best education system in the world. Europe has a remarkable quality of life and the least violence in, in, in the world, and yet people are putting it at risk. Frankly, it's incomprehensible. And when you look at NATO, you know, the United States of America was attacked from Afghanistan. Europe is still with the United States of America in Afghanistan. Now, not in my judgment in the best strategic way today, because I think we need to transition and transition away, and there are ways to do that using a platform against terror that would benefit all of us without uh, maintaining an unsupportable forever presence, which I think is unsustainable, but we're not trying to do that, and we're not doing it, and NATO is the entity that would do it and is there right now. I've sat at a table in, in, in uh, Brussels with 52 nations around the table, with maybe even more, 50 sub-nations. Extraordinary. And each nation would report on what it was doing in Afghanistan. Do the Chinese or the Russians call on the world to do that? Do we see the kind of response that NATO has been able to promote in the interest of helping Europe stabilize to some degree during the migration when we called on NATO to become involved and deal with that? And what about, obviously, uh, the, uh, 
extraordinary efforts with respect to Ukraine. We pulled together a major, major reassurance program for the frontline states. We made clear that we were serious about Article 5. And the only nation in the world that I know of in the 21st century that has sent its military personnel in uniform, though disguised, across international lines is Russia. And Russia is one of the countries promoting the notion that the liberal order of the West is dead and the United States of America is in decline, among other things. So, uh, folks, this is a time to be pretty hard-nosed about, uh, about where our interests lie and how we protect our interests. We are of common value, values. Europe and the United States, the transatlantic alliance, and what we, anybody will tell you, I think if you talk to a lot of Republicans, Bob Corker was here yesterday, others, they will tell you what is happening in our country today in, in, in this administration is, uh, it's an aberration. It is, uh, it's even hard to predict for people in the administration where it's gonna be tomorrow or the next day. So yes, there are legitimate questions being asked today of a president who attacked NATO, who, uh, personally insulted the Chancellor of Germany, who uh, pulled the rug out from under the Prime Minister of Britain who was trying to negotiate on Brexit, who has, you know, I mean, you can run a list, right? And, and, the, and the problem is, yes, there is a question about will this president, in fact, be there? And that's why there's discussion about 100,000 troops and there's discussion, but I, I can guarantee the vast majority of the American people and every person I know on either side of the aisle, bipartisanly, who has any chance of being a president of the United States in the future, believes that NATO is critical and they would object to any movement away from it and they will support Article 5. So I do not accept some of the literature I have read where people are saying irreparable damage to the transatlantic alliance. No, I don't believe that. Not irreparable. I think much of it curable in a matter of days and weeks, if not hours, by reaffirmations, by restatements of support, by recommitments. But what is important, my friends, is that Europe itself begin to define these values and these interests, and that Europe itself articulate with greater strength the value of standing together to have partners in developing defense capacity in Poland, developing defense capacity in, in Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia and so forth. That's vital. And to having our ability to be able to move to arms control and other efforts. That brings up a different topic. I won't go there now. But I think the, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we have two billion young people in the world. About 15 years old to 24. Many of them live in places where if they don't get enfranchisement and, and, a, and a part of the world, this globalized world, that satisfies their knowledge of what everybody in the world has, because everybody has a smartphone. They may not have a job, but they have a smartphone. They may not have a future, but they have a smartphone. They may not have a vote, but they have a smartphone. And they see what everybody else has. And I'm telling you, with, with 1.8 billion kids, 15 years old or younger, 350 million of whom are not gonna go to school, and they live, many of them, in countries that do affect Europe already as a consequence of conflict, you need a NATO. And NATO has the ability to adjust to those kinds of threats. We shouldn't be limited just by what created NATO. We face threats going forward. Perhaps the biggest of all was mentioned earlier, cyber. You can bring countries to their heels in nanoseconds, pushing a button. 20 people in a barn somewhere in Eastern Europe or somewhere else in the world who are properly funded <clears throat> have the ability to be able to terrorize a nation, if not bring it to its heels. That's our threat. And we need an entity like NATO that can help guide what our, our protocol is gonna be with respect to cyber going forward. We began to do that with President Obama, but there's nothing happening today that convinces me that we are doing the kind of things we did to rein in nuclear weapons 
We're not doing that with cyber. We need the same type of nuclear negotiation for cyber that we had to begin to go from 50,000 warheads pointing at each other in Reykjavik when, uh, when Reagan and Gorbachev sat down. Now we're down to 1,500 and some, and we propose going lower. So NATO is critical to the ability to give confidence to people about those values, about those interests, and, and it is the strongest vehicle we have right now to provide co cohesion to the defense and security of a critical friend, ally, trading block, and value-based uh, 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 alliance. And I think that is irrefutably uh, uh, a moment of strength and something we should adhere to, not seek to undermine and destroy. Thank you, John. Thank you, very impressive. Um, now, let me turn to the German defense minister. Um, you know, listening to John Kerry, one question that might come up is, so if, if, if it's like that, why would we need a European army? Why do we need um, uh, to talk about autonomy of Europeans, et cetera? Can you explain to us a little bit what uh, the motivation is and to what extent these ideas about European capabilities are or are not uh, helpful to the larger NATO effort, please. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, John, uh, for, and I can underline each of your words. Um, you know, NATO, if, if we wouldn't have it today, we should invent it. Um, it is an indispensable NATO we do have, and I'll uh, reinforce what, what you said. Uh, we are totally aware that um, NATO, yes, it is the strongest military alliance in the world, but why do we have it? Because it is a, an alliance of values, an alliance of democracy, who have sworn to each other that we will defend each other undisputed uh, uh, and without any regard whether it's a mighty and a large country or small and little country. And um, this, this sentence of, um, and this feeling in NATO, that we are defending together values of democracy, the freedom, the rule of law, the dignity of every single person, humanity, in humanity, this, these are the values why we came together, as you pointed out, 70 years ago. But today, if we look around, those are all values that are under pressure again. And therefore, NATO is, again, in a period of transformation, indispensable, and it's our task to make it, um, to have it adapted to the new challenges we do have. Now, referring to your question, NATO is an alliance of 29, and uh, we will, as you said, Jens, one for all and all for one, um, we will, if, if one square centimeter is being attacked um, <coughs> in our territory, we will stand up together. Be it Montenegro or be it the United States. You uh, reminded us of the one time the Article one, uh, five, 5 has been pulled, the collective defense, that was 9-11, and we all stood up together to defend um, the freedom and to fight terror. So this principle is ironclad. Europe has always been asked to step up and to get organized. Europe, now 28 countries, is what defense matters are concerned, has been for a very, very long time very fragmented. 28 different armed forces, no planning process, um, a huge amount of different weapon systems. So a, an enormously ineffective way to maintain them, to train the personnel that is necessary for it, to uh, have the procurement, to buy the procurement, or to de develop the procurement. There was always the demand for, um, from our friends towards Europe, get organized. And there's a second reason why Europe is getting organized. Um, there are 
many, many threats and situations where I do see NATO without any question. And you mentioned many of them. I will not repeat them. But there are places or problems that are of utmost importance for Europe, but I do not see NATO there. One typical example is Africa. Um, this is our immediate neighborhood. And Europe has to act and react together with our neighborhood, Africa, in what we call comprehensive security, which is diplomacy, economic development, and the ability to stabilize by military or police. Up to a, two years, a couple of years ago, Europe in general was not able to react to a crisis that concerned our interest in a timely manner because we had neither structures nor procedures for that. Now, with the evolving crisis around us, Europe, one and a half year ago, <coughs> decided to build up the European Defense Union to get organized as Europeans what our defense is concerned, the planning process, the European Defense Fund for funding that, to harmonize uh, the weapon systems and the different armed forces we do have. And I'm deeply convinced it will not only strengthen the ability and the credibility of Europe to act and react in its immediate neighborhood or when its interests are concerned, but it will also and is also strengthening NATO because of course we are complementary to NATO. As I'm sitting here as a German defense minister, I have the NATO hat, I'm a member of NATO, and I'm a member of the European Union. And we do have, I do have one single set of forces, that is the Bundeswehr. And of course, it is sensible and effective to work together with our friends in Europe and together with our friends in NATO that each of the two structures is able to work <coughs> complementary together. But we have different fields where we are called upon. So NATO will always be collective defense. NATO will always be Article 5. But the European Defense Union will represent in future the ability of the European Union to protect Europe and to act in a comprehensive way with diplomacy, economic, economic development, and if necessary, military means. I'm looking at our clock, which is ticking. And I think we need to try to speed up a little bit in order to have sufficient time for, for our Q&A session. Um, turning to the Polish foreign minister, uh, maybe a question that uh, would go directly you know, uh, uh, to Poland is the following question. About 20 years ago, 21 years ago or so, we negotiated the so-called NATO-Russia Founding Act, which uh, contains strict limitations. Uh, for example, no nuclear weapons in new member states of future new member states, et cetera, et cetera. I would be interested in your view. Should we, given Russian behavior over the last four, almost five years in Ukraine, et cetera, should we now stick to the NATO-Russia Founding Act, to this agreement? Should we um, uh, adhere to the limitations? Um, or should we, as some are proposing, should we throw that overboard and do even more uh, in terms of bolstering uh, countries like your own? Very important question. I think that... Mm, it's right to ask this question, but let me just start by saying that we will celebrate this year the 70th anniversary of the creation of NATO, but also very important anniversary for Poland and other countries from our region, which is 20th anniversary of joining NATO. Poland, together with Hungary and Czech Republic, will celebrate that uh, anniversary in March. And it was a very important step. Since that time, we feel really secure and safe in Europe. We joined community of uh, free democratic states. It was a very fortunate decision because after that time, Russia started to change its, for, its foreign policy. 
becoming more aggressive. It is now we can call this policy as revisionist policy with uh, aggression in Georgia in 2008 and then also Ukraine. So it was a very good decision. Maybe today it would be much more difficult to simply have acceptance to that enlargement of NATO. Very important decision was taken um, in the, at Warsaw uh, Summit uh, 2016 to deploy forces from NATO countries in Baltic states, Poland, Romania, in order to guarantee and to demonstrate to Russia that aggression will not go unnoticed or unpunished. So for us, NATO is very important to deter Russian uh, forces. Now you asked uh, uh, about, about the NATO-Russia founding act. Of course, it is similarity in FTT to a certain extent. Both uh, parties should obey to what they, what they decide it should follow. Russia broke that act. And in our opinion, you, can, you cannot break something which is already broken. <laughs> Therefore, we have a right to defend ourselves and to deploy forces. Uh, it was already provided in the treaty, one division. Oh, what, what does it mean? Substantial forces. Uh, Poland um, does not share with uh, Germany, France, other countries in the West the same security or threat perception. We share that threat perception with the countries from our region. We simply uh, fear Russian aggressive policy. Therefore, we are more, much more, so to say, um, we, we want more uh, American deployment of troops because in our opinion, transatlantic bonds and uh, American army is the only deterrent Russia uh, takes into consideration when they think about its foreign policy. We are not against European army. It's very just and uh, justified action to mobilize uh, countries within the European Union to spend more on defense and to create forces which can uh, act on their own. But in our opinion, only transatlantic links, therefore only NATO is a real uh, security guarantor for our countries. So this is how we see the situation. So I can um, just summarize my uh, short introduction that in Europe there, there are different threat perceptions and countries to the east, uh, close to the eastern flank of NATO have kind of a different priorities. Therefore for us, American uh, um, cooperation with the United States in the field of military is crucial and also Poland uh, is uh, decided to spend much more on defense and we will increase uh, from 2% now to 2.5% uh, in, in future in order to take also our burden to invest in common uh, defense. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Kishore, you published a book not, not so long ago with the very provocative title, Has the West Lost It? <laughs> so here's my question. Have a copy here. <laughs> so here's my question: Has the West lost it? When you listen to this discussion, um, or mm. to put it a little more, I, I guess intelligently, uh, what role do you see as a as as looking at NATO and our region from the outside, from an Asian perspective? Mm. What role do you see for the transatlantic alliance in a in the evolving international system, in this new landscape of uh, quote unquote great power competition, et cetera, et cetera. Kishori, well, try I, to be I, I brief. Know, I, know, I know you're watching the clock. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'll make uh, three very quick mm -hmm. uh, points to answer your question uh, directly. The first point I want to make, and it's an important point, I think from the point of view of the rest of the world, at a time when everything is changing, right? We are entering a new era of world history. And just to give you a, how, how dramatic the change is, you had 200 years of Western domination of world history. Today, in PPP terms, the number one economy is China, number two is the United States, number three is India, number four is Japan. Not one European country in the top four. It's a different world. So with everything changing, it's good to have some pillars of stability in the world, right? And since the West created, in many ways, 
the global architecture post-1945, which is still, I think, working and holding the world together. And I, I spent 10 years as ambassador to the UN, so I know that this, these, many of these global multilateral institutions work, and they rest on the transatlantic alliance as the substructure of the global uh, governance architecture. So the rest of the world doesn't want to see this transatlantic alliance being shaken. It's good if it stays together. But my second point at the same time is that at the end of the day, an alliance is about threats. Now, threats, as you know, are, we are talking about geopolitical threats. The word geopolitical means geography political. Now, the geography of Europe is very different from the geography of the United States or North America. And the number one threat that Europe is going to face in the 21st century is not the number one threat that America is going to face in the 21st century. To put it very bluntly, what, the, what Europe's going to face, in 1950, Europe's population was twice that of Africa's. Today, Africa's population is twice that of Europe's. By 2100, it's going to be 10 times the size of Europe. I guarantee you. You've already seen a few, what a few boats have done, right? <laughs> they have distorted the whole political process in Europe. You've had these populist parties coming in because people are frightened of these boats coming. And the leaders haven't paid attention to the people's fears. The peoples are not worried about Russian tanks coming tomorrow. They're more worried about the African migrants coming. And here, Secretary of State John Kerry is absolutely right. When he talks about the young 2 billion people with a smartphone, more and more of them are going to come. And how do you keep them out? So that brings me to my third point. You've got to, de you've got to develop Africa economically. That's only one solution. And who's the number one potential partner for Europe for the economic development of Africa? Who's the number one investor in Africa today? It's China. So it's quite, it would be quite natural if you look at geography, political, geopolitical uh, interests, there's a convergence of interests within Europe and China to develop Africa economically and hold back the boat people. But I guarantee you, and that's what my next book is about, in the next 10 years, there will be a spike in US-China rivalry. No number one power gives up its number one power that easily. And China's economy, in nominal market terms, will become number one in 10 to 15 years. There will be a tremendous Sino-American geopolitical struggle coming. And then, where does Europe stand? Does it look after its own geographic interests and work with China and Africa? Or does it work with the United States to counterbalance China and sacrifice its interests? Now, these are hard questions. There are no easy answers. But what I would recommend to the Transatlantic Alliance, since we want you to continue, we want you to remain strong, please have some very hard-headed discussions among yourself about how you keep this transatlantic alliance strong in a 21st century, which is completely different from the 20th century. Great, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's a thought-provoking point that you're making. We are now uh, inviting all of you to uh, ask questions. Who would like to ask the first question? Again, Hello. please identify yourself, if you could. Thank you. My name is Ludmila Batura. I'm Global Shaper from Minsk Hub. I have a question to Mr. Stoltenberg, Mr. Kerry, and Mr. Zaputovic. Um, recently, in uh, foreign media, uh, on foreign media in press, there has been a dispute whether Russia will occupy Belarus. So I was wondering, uh, what is your opinion? Whether this will happen? How this will happen? Whether it will be like a, a military aggression or not? And uh, if it will happen, what could be the response of NATO? Thank you. All right. Jens? Uh, so <laughs> first of all, I think that we have to just uh, assume that that will not happen. Uh, so, uh, uh, because I think it's extremely important to stand up for the sovereignty and the territorial integrity for every nation in uh, Europe. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, we have seen uh, that uh, Russia has violated the territorial integrity of uh, uh, several neighbors, uh, 
Russia has troops in Moldova uh, without uh, the consent of the government in Chisinau. They have uh, uh, troops in uh, two uh, uh, parts of Georgia, uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, uh, and, uh, of course, they have illegally annexed uh, Crimea and, uh, and uh, they are destabilizing uh, eastern Ukraine. And we have seen the, act the aggressive actions of, uh, of uh, Russia in the, in the, in the uh, Sea of Azov. Um, what NATO is doing is that as, re as, uh, as response, not least to this uh, more assertive uh, Russia and the more uh, these aggressive actions of Russia, we have as I said, uh, significantly strengthened the readiness of our forces, uh, increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance, and European allies are now investing more in defense, and US is increasing their presence in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. And the reason why we do that is to prevent conflict. The main reason for NATO's deterrence is uh, to send a clear signal to any potential adversary that if any ally is attacked, the whole of NATO will be there. And that's the best way to avoid any conflict. And, um, and uh, so NATO is responding, uh, and, um, and, uh, and uh, we are ready then to, of course, uh, defend any uh, NATO ally. Belarus is not a member of NATO. John, you want to add something to that? No, I think that covers it. That covers it. Yeah. If I may just add to this, of course, Belarus is a very important neighbor of Poland, and we support <clears throat> sovereignty, territorial integrity, independence of Belarus. I think that also there is a role for the European Union to support pro-European orientation in the country. We will celebrate this year, indeed we do, we do it already, the 10th anniversary of Eastern Partnership Program. So we have to be creative and try to somehow uh, simply support society. Of course, you ask about some dramatic events concerning aggression. Uh, there will be breach of international law by Russia if it happens. Therefore, I think the reaction of international communities should be strong, and NATO, both European Union, other actors, should give clear signals to Russia that it will be not tolerated. You're next. Uh, hello, I'm Trisha de Borgrave. I'm a freelance writer. I just wanted to ask you, in terms of um, the cohesion of Europe and, and standing and, and, and standing up for its own, and to be uh, legitimately looked at in the world as a force for good and power, could could you comment a little bit on what its relationship should be to um, a, a divisive country such as Iran? Now, who will take that question? Any, any takers? If well, I may... Uh, sorry. John, 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 please. Well, let, let me... I want to preface my answer to that, and I'll answer it very directly, um, <clears throat> by also stating that um, as I talk about the strength of Europe, the importance of Europe and the importance of the values and the interests being represented, I don't close my eyes to the notion that Europe needs to uh, make some reforms and engage in some significant discussion about so some of the uh, institutional atrophy, if you will, a little bit. Um, or, do put, you know, I think Angela Merkel in her speech yesterday made some comments about this. So I would agree with that. And I think the same thing with respect to um, looking at these threats. Uh, the, the, the fact is that if suddenly we're out of the INF Treaty and you, you have a new kind of arms race, <laughs> that's just going to put an exclamation point on why you need a NATO, uh, because that's a geopolitical threat. And, and so I think that the arguments build rather than diminish. Now, with respect to Iran, um, Europe played a very important role. I mean, this was a partnership, which is, again, an argument for multilateralism. Russia, China, even in the midst of Ukraine, Russia cooperated, worked very closely in order to get the nuclear arms agreement with Iran and, and to help create a structure where we had a responsible use of, of enriched uranium and we, we dealt with the challenge in a multilateral way. And, and seven countries signed this agreement. And what's significant about the agreement and Iran is uh, that 
Those countries are working very hard right now to keep that agreement alive. They still believe in it. What is it that President Xi and President Putin and President Macron and, President, and, and Chancellor Merkel and, and Prime Minister May know about the Iran deal that Donald Trump doesn't? Actually, maybe I shouldn't ask that question. <laughs> but I mean, seriously, think about it. They're all staking, even as they know Iran is mischievous and is doing things in Yemen, doing things with missiles, doing things with Hezbollah, threatening Israel, engaged in Iraq, all of which we object to. And the Obama administration objected too. By the way, we did things about it. We kept the sanctions in place on each of those things. We raised the sanctions because they were doing it. And I agree with the notion that we need a follow-on agreement with respect to what Iran is doing. But are you stronger getting a follow-on agreement by coming to the Europeans and others who signed the agreement and say to them, hey, guys, I don't like this deal. And I'm prepared to get out of it, but I'm going to do it in a year. And I'm going to call on you to join me to get a follow-on agreement from the Iranians with respect to Hezbollah and missiles and other things. Don't you think we're stronger going into that together to leverage the, the, the uh, follow-on agreement? That's not what we did. The president just pulled out, walked away, and has engaged in an uh, effort to create such rigid uh, application of secondary sanctions and other things that what he's really engaged in is a regime change initiative. That's obvious to anybody who understands this. But in effect, what it has done is strengthen the IRGC, strengthen the very people who didn't want a nuclear agreement and who said to the Supreme Leader, don't negotiate with the United States, you can't trust them. Mm. So it's turned everything on its ear in a way that will not achieve the very goal we want to achieve with respect to Iran. So I, look, I think, you also have to look inside Iran. You can't just be a you know, blanket statement about whole nation. Uh, there are huge differences between Arab Sunni and Shia Persian. Mm -hmm. And people don't acknowledge that in any way whatsoever when they start talking about hegemony in the region and this and that. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, uh, particularly with the United States uh, locked in with our other friends in the region and making it clear we're not going to let that happen. So false threats should not command the attention of, of and I'm not saying the missiles are a real threat, the, the transfer of weapons are real threats. But in other ways, some things have been exaggerated that I think uh, make it very difficult to, to find a, a way forward that the world merits in, in this kind of situation. Uh, Iran, uh, I, I, in many ways, I tried to get Iran and Saudi Arabia to sit down. And King Salman actually said to me, yeah, I think we can make that happen, we should. And it's never happened. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned fighting in a war as a young man was before you commit your people to go fight somewhere, you really owe it to them to exhaust the opportunities of diplomacy, not rush the war. But we were, before we got the Iran deal, rushing to conflict. There are three major leaders of countries who came to us and said, you have to bomb Iran. And President Obama said, you know what? I'm going to do diplomacy before we do that. And look what happened. So that's how I think we manage Iran, by building our alliance with our friends, by working in a way that cohesively leverages the diplomatic outcome that you want to get, rather than just unilaterally going off and pulling out of Paris, pulling out of TPP, pulling out of this, pulling out of Iran, pulling out of Syria. Uh, I mean, that's not <clears throat> what happened to the greatest negotiator. If, yeah. if I may add to this picture, within the uh, European Union Foreign Ministers uh, Council, we discuss very often the situation in Iran, and I think that we share, the Europeans and the Americans, they share assessment of the and the role of Iran, which is a problem in the Middle East. We do not agree on how to deal with that. Poland, together with other EU member states, says that JCPOA is, has positive impact and we stand by that agreement. The United States uh, decided to withdraw. Now the problem is that, in my opinion, only acting together as a transatlantic community, we can, we can be effective in generally dealing with the Middle East. Therefore, 
Myself with Mike Pompeo, we invited uh, ministers from all over the world to the conference in Warsaw. It will be held the 13th or 14th of February to discuss that issue. So we will listen to ministers, to countries of the region, how they see the problem, because we think that Again, transatlantic community is a value and we have to find a possibility to work together and to address that very important problem today. Good. It's an important point. Ursula von der Leyen. Yes. Um, thank you, John, again for uh, your words, because um, <coughs> if I may refer to your uh, brilliant analysis, um, yes, there are the two superpowers, the United States and China, um, but you were asking where is the role of Europe in between. Well, the European experience is the experience that if we have a club of egoists and if we fight each other, we're all losing. So um, our bitter experience of the last century was if we work together, it might be slower, it might be bumpy and messy sometimes and loud and chaotic, but in the very end, it's a win-win situation for all of us, the middle powers and countries. And therefore, it is a question of uh, do we want a zero-sum game that always needs one winner who needs a loser? Or do we want to invest in the win-win situation that can occur? They are slower, as I said, and they need a lot of diplomacy. They need a lot of compromises. But I think over time, this is, going to be what's, this is going to be the model that's going to keep our world peaceful and inclusive. And therefore, I see a European role in promoting this logic of win-win situation and in promoting, because we are 28 uh, very different countries, in promoting the value in itself of multilateralism, a vibrant multilateralism, to be a vanguard for that principle. And this is a role which I expect uh, Europe to play. Just, just one line. We completely support it, but please show some determination. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if I may just say that, when I was born, yeah. there were six countries in the European Union. Mm. Today I'm 60 years old, mm. we have 28. It's a huge success story. Mm. It's an economic superpower. No, I agree, power. I agree. So 500 million people um, peacefully together. Uh, after reunification, our friends who joined us, it was a win-win situation for all of us. Prosperity rose. So um, there is a lot of dedication behind it. And we want to complete this and write on this success story in the security and defense sector, but always keeping in mind that multilateralism is the foundation of our work. There was somebody back there. Yes, please. Um, hi, uh, my name is Alvaro Sainz, and uh, my question is directed to the Minister of Defense of um, Germany. So one of the things you mentioned about was that NATO was the coming of, of common values and um, democracies. And uh, the survival of the alliance is clearly important and top of mind for, for you all. How do you deal with a member of NATO who is no longer sharing the values of democracy, putting thousands of people in jail, including many journalists, and it, it, it has become a pseudo-democracy, a, a, uh, you know, a strongman, if you will, um, um, pretending to be a, a democracy. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Because you have the survival of NATO, but you also have members who will start uh, not sharing the values you have. Yeah. Um, the, the principle of an alliance is that, um, and, and the, the examples you're pointing out, if you look at the history of NATO, we had over and over these situations where one member state um, took a wrong turning, if I may say so. And the principle always was, it is better to have the country in our alliance and to work over time to find the road back to democracy and our values than to have it excluded and uh, as an opponent. And uh, there are many, many people in the countries you're referring to that are thriving for democracy, that are working for these values. So it's worth to work hard together. We have different issues without any question. 
but the discussion about these issues and the work together to find back to the cohesion within the alliance concerning these values is 100 times more worth it than exclusion and than conflicts that are almost unsolvable. I think we have time for maybe one very brief question, but really just a sentence or so, and one brief answer, because we are practically running out of time now. My name is Lena, I'm from Singapore. Uh, my question is, with the enthusiasm from the Eastern European countries, the NATO members in China's Belt and Road Initiative, do you see this weakening of unity within the NATO members? Okay, who wants to take that one? Well, with, Jens, with, I think. No, uh, I don't see any weakening of, uh, of unity uh, in, within the NATO. Actually, I, I, I see the opposite. But, but having said that, we have to understand the following. NATO is an alliance of 29 allies. They are different. Uh, they have different history, different backgrounds, some from North America, uh, many of them from uh, Europe. Uh, different political leaders are elected. Sometimes they, they disagree on important issues as trade or, or climate or, or many other issues. And they choose different parts on many different things. But they unite around the core task of NATO. And that is that we defend and protect each other because especially in a world with more uncertainties, more threats and more challenges, this is extremely important. And some are concerned about the size of China. Well, China is big, that's fair. Uh, but, but NATO, meaning one billion people, Europe and North America uh, together, is really a big uh, alliance which is able to cope with all threats and challenges we face in the world today, as long as we stand together. I think that was a pretty good closing remark. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.